healing service. Yes. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Whew. Is that hot in here or what? Yeah. Man. <laughs> Lift your hands up, will you, please? Glory! Oh, glory, glory. Thank you, Dad. Oh. <laughs> Let's turn to the book of Revelation and get a revelation. Where did the water come from? Man? Oh. <laughs> Hallelujah. Go ahead, lift your hands up and get all the drink. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. Who we? Oh. Oh. <coughs> Anybody got a testimony? <laughs> um, uh, one of the things that I want, I, I, <clears throat> I'd like everybody to be prepared on, and that is to bring a testimony. I want to hear two testimonies every time we start a service. Two testimonies. So be prepared to bring a testimony. What has the Lord done? something recent for you. I don't hear, I want to hear what the church has done. I don't want to hear what the program has done. I want to hear what dad's done. Amen. Okay. <laughs> I say go to Revelation. <sighs> Revelation 1 and verse 5. Oh. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Is everybody there? Let's speak it together. If we can. <laughs> and from Jesus Christ, a faithful witness, a firstborn from the dead and a ruler over the kings of the earth, to whom who loved us, washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. So we see here that we are called to be kings and priests but before we can become kings, we must fulfill priesthood. 
and priests are to minister first to the Lord. If you can't minister to the Lord, you got no right ministering to nobody else. And, and in this ministry, it's because in this ministry to the Lord, even these moments of intimacy, it's associated with ministering to the Lord. In other words, when that, when you touch his heart, he touches yours. And there's a contact that happens. And it's like, you know, nothing matters anymore. Nothing. It doesn't even matter what you did in your life. It's gone. Everything is gone. All of everything that your desires and your plans are all gone. And the only thing you want is more of him. That's it. And it's amazing how many believers have never reached that moment of intimacy. In that moment of intimacy, you will give up everything and everyone. Nothing matters. And this is what a priest is supposed to come to. The moment of intimacy where he ministers or she ministers to the Lord. And what this does is it makes contact with the other side. And in this contact, you have made contact. And what this contact does, it releases the priestly garments on you. I'm going to say this again. In the contact, the priestly garments are released and you are dressed with the priestly garments because you can't dress yourself. Uh, again, when there is contact made with the throne of heaven, which releases our priestly garments, these garments are worn under the warrior armor of God. This is the process to fulfill the order of Melchizedek. And I'm not going to talk about that today. <laughs> but we will Tuesday. God willing. Go to Revelation 2. And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say that they are apostles or, and are not, and have found them liars. You have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Well, that sounds like a good church. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. In other words, you have not maintained your priestly position. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you what? Unless you repent. Losing your first love is not maintaining your priesthood. When you lose your first love, it's because you're not maintaining your priesthood. You're not making content. And when you do that, you begin to promote carnal strength and fleshly reactions. You can only go so far holding a hymn book. <laughs> Again, you can only go so far holding the hymn book. Without the freedom of worship, there is not much advancement. It only promotes religious attributes and limitations of spiritual giftings and warfare. Again, without the freedom of worship, there's not much advancement. 
and only promotes religious attributes and limitations of spiritual gifting and warfare. It also promotes the lack of freedom to self and others because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom and the anointing breaks the yoke. So before you and I, we have a teaching priest before warriors, we must understand that you must maintain your priestly, your priesthood. You must maintain your priestly garments and that's by making contact with the other side. Where there's a moment of intimacy, the garments are released and you're dressed. And these garments must be maintained because if they are not maintained under the armor of God, then you become grumpy, miserable. You become fleshly, you react more. Your focus is on you. Ooh, that hurts. Ooh, ooh, me. Ooh. You're very easy to be offended. You become critical and criticizing. You become a grumbler and a complainer. Did you ever see someone put on clothes? Oh, this just doesn't fit right. Well, your, your armor won't fit right either. You'll end up stumbling over it because you don't have the under armor. See, I have mine on. <laughs> see? Hallelujah. <laughs> now you can't go by under armor. I mean, you can in a store. <laughs> I'm talking about priestly armor, all right? You can't go buy it. The price that you pay is to die to yourself, make contact, in, that moment of intimacy where the armor is released. <sighs> Malachi chapter 2. Whew. Malachi chapter 2. <laughs> oh. Ah, uh, is everybody there? <laughs> Hallelujah. No, are you there? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's speak this together, please. Verse 1. Now, O priest, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear and if you will not take it to heart. Now, hold on a second. Taking it to heart. Taking it to heart. You know, taking it to heart means that when the Spirit speaks, you take it and you force it, you cause it, you put it in. Has everybody got it? You take it to heart because you make it a life and death. When God speaks, He speaks life without obeying its death. So everybody got it? In other words, you take it to heart. By taking it to heart, you take what He says and you cause it to come into your heart. Taking it to heart means taking what you hear of truth from God and put it into your heart. Now, in the word heart is multiple meanings. It can mean spirit sometimes. It can mean soul. It can mean mind and emotions and will and so forth. But when you take it to heart, it means that you're going to obey, you're going to practice it, and you're going to take it serious as a life and death situation. He says in verse 2, if 
you will not hear in if you will not take it to heart to give glory to my name, says the Lord of hosts, I will send a curse upon you. Are we priests? Amen. And I will curse your blessings. Yes, I have cursed them already because you did not take it to heart. In other words, the things that he is saying. It's amazing and how many people just nonchalantly, God says something, oh yeah, oh yeah. And don't take it to heart. They reject the counsel of the Lord. And they wonder why things happen in their life. They wonder why the devil continues to steal, kill, and destroy. They wonder why God's not restoring things. They wonder why God's not doing this or God's not doing it. Then they go out and do it themselves. And it doesn't last. Then they spend all the time maintaining what they've earned by themselves because it wasn't a blessing from the Lord. Because when it's a blessing from the Lord, you don't have to maintain the blessings. You maintain the relationship. Verse 3. Behold, I will rebuke your descendants and spread refuge on their faces and, refu and refuge on your solemn feasts. And one will take you away with it. Then you shall know that I have sent this commandment to you, that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with them, one of life and peace, and I gave them to the, him that he might fear me, reverence me, honor me, respect me. So he feared me and was reverent before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth and injustice was not found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and he turned many away from iniquity. For the lips of the priest should keep knowledge. A people should seek the law from his mouth for he is a messenger of the Lord of hosts. But you have departed from the way and you have caused many to stumble at the law you have corrupt the covenant of levi says the lord of hosts therefore i also have made you contemptible and base before all the people because you have not kept my ways but have shown partiality in the law have we not all one Father? Have not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously with one another by profaning the covenant of the fathers? Judah has dealt treacherously and an abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's holy institution which he loves. He has married the daughter of a foreign God. May the Lord cut off the tents of Jacob. The man who does these, being awake and aware, yet who brings an offering to the Lord of hosts. In other words, the person is awake and aware, yet he comes and brings an offering to the Lord. The Lord will not accept it. Again, it is vitally important to take it to heart of what the Spirit says. This is not religion. This is not an area where you do your ritual and you feel good about yourself. I hear many people, yeah, I went to church. No relationship. I read two chapters a day. Well, do you seek the Lord? Or oh, yeah, in the book. They don't even know the Lord. Only what they read about. There's a difference taking it to heart, fulfilling your priesthood. That is the first call, the first office of every believer. Every believer, the first office is to fulfill priesthood. You can't serve without fulfilling priesthood. 1 Peter chapter 4. Taking it to heart means putting it in your heart. First Peter chapter 4 and verse 1. It's amazing now how many people put other things before God.
In verse 1, therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves. Arm yourselves with what? The same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the loss of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in a lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation speaking evil of you. It's amazing to me. I think it's strange that a believer should go back to it. That's strange to me. Why would a believer go back to it? Why would a believer go back to lust? Why would a believer go back to drinking? Why would a believer go back to pornography? Why would a believer go back to the world? Because they've never made contact or maintaining contact. They don't maintain their priesthood. And they've gone to religion instead of relationship. Saying that they know God. If you know God, you don't do those things. If you know Him, you don't do those things. He's first. If you know Him, there's a reverence, there's an honor, and there's a respect. It's called the fear of the Lord. Let me tell you, you may know him one day and the next day it's gone. Has everybody got it? Some people, how did I get to this place? Because you did not make contact with the other side. You did not maintain your priesthood. There wasn't the moment of intimacy. You came and worshipped and never got intimate. Some people just, yeah, yeah, yeah. Ooh, and then go. Really not taking it to heart. Not setting it. Not grabbing the heart of God. Not touching the heart of God. Believe me, the enemy looks for those individuals. Because he knows if he can get them, they can bring more shame to the Lord because they've been proclaiming to know the Lord. He's not the one that's going after, that doesn't say they don't know the Lord. He's going after the ones that say they know the Lord. Is everybody okay? Verse 4 again, in regard to these things, I think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation. Speaking evil of you. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel is preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the Spirit. Verse 7, read it with me. But the end of all things is at hand, therefore be what? Serious and watchful in your prayers. Be serious. Stop wasting time on fulfilling your desires of pleasure and assumptions and do what you hear and see from the Spirit. Remember, your desire can speak louder than the voice of God if you allow it. Amen? You must discern. But how are you going to discern if you're not making contact? That voice of the stranger will slip right in and start pushing you and you won't even realize that you're being pushed. It's a gentle push. But a gentle push is different than a lead. The Bible says that we are led by the Spirit, not pushed by the Spirit. Amen? Amen? Is everybody okay? Anybody okay? Yeah. Good. Daniel 10. Taking it to heart. The word tells us that people, sometimes people look at the preacher and just thinking that it's a preacher speaking. And not going beyond because they can't see beyond. They just think that it's just some preacher speaking. When it's got nothing to do with a preacher speaking. This ain't me speaking. It's just the spirit using this voice. It's the anointing that teaches us, not man. Has everybody got it? It's the anointing that teaches us, not man. But see, the carnal mind can't comprehend those things because they're still in darkness. 
They can't see. They can't hear. They have a hard time. Because they're perishing. Daniel chapter 10. Oh, hallelujah. Is everybody there? In verse 7. Daniel 10 and verse 7. Then I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. What did he see? He had a vision. For the men who were with me did not see the vision. But a great terror fell upon them, so they fled to hide themselves. Therefore, I was left alone when I saw this great vision, and no strength remained in me, for my vigor was turned into frailty in me, and I retained no strength. Yet I heard the sound of his words, and while I heard the sound of his words, I was in a deep sleep on my face, with my face to the ground. Suddenly a hand touched me, which made me tremble on my knees and on the palms of my hands. And he said to me, O Daniel, man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak to you and stand upright, for I have been sent to you. While he was speaking this word to me, I stood trembling. Then he said to me, Do not fear, Daniel, for from the first day that you what? Set your heart to understand and to humble yourself before your God, your words were heard, and I have come because of your words. Set your heart to understand. He was setting his heart to understand the vision. He humbled himself. In other words, he denied himself. He didn't assume. He didn't predict. And he didn't run. Until understanding came. Has everybody got it? He didn't run with the vision at all. He got a vision. He was going to take it to heart. He wanted to take the vision to heart to understand fully. He didn't run with it. He didn't assume it. and He didn't predict it. He waited. So what he did is he set his heart to the Lord so he could take it to heart and humbled himself. And he prayed and didn't take it anywhere until he had understanding of it. It's amazing how many times people run with visions. I had a vision. Yes, the Lord showed me this. Yes, the Lord. Boom, they're gone. They show, the Lord made a show them, but they got no understanding of it. And he waited. Amen. To take it to heart. He waited to put it into his heart. Not of a self-will or a desire. But from God. Is everybody okay? Jeremiah 32. Jeremiah 32. Verse 28. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give this, this city into the hand of the Chaldeans and to the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and he shall take it. And the Chaldeans who fight against this city shall come and set fire to this city and burn it with houses on whose Roofs, they have offered incense to Baal and poured out drink offerings to other gods to provoke me to anger. See, people don't realize that when the idols in people's lives are known as other gods, they pour out drink offerings to other gods. They, they incense is associated to prayer. They speak to other, not even realizing that they do it. 
because they are chasing a desire or a false vision, and it becomes a god to them. It becomes an idol. Then they begin to fuel it when they have no understanding about it. And it's not the Lord. Amen. Or it's not God's time. Now it becomes an idol. Now that prayer for that becomes an incense. And it's not the right incense. It's not the right prayer. People begin to worship the vision instead of the creator. So everybody got it? This is the ploy of the enemy. They begin to worship self. In verse 30, because the children of Israel and the children of Judah have done only evil before me from their youth. For the children of Israel have provoked me uh, only to anger with the work of their hands, says the Lord. For this city has been to me a provocation of my anger and my fury from the day that they built it. Even to this day, so I will remove it from before my face. Because all the evil of the children of Israel and the children of Judah, which they have done to provoke me to anger, they, their kings, their princes, their priests, their prophets, the men of Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And they have, verse 33, everybody read it with me. And they have turned to me the back and not the face. See, when you don't take it to heart, you turn your back to him. Has everybody got it? You turn your back to him because you take it as a nonchalant thing. You turn your back to him and not your face to him. When you take it to heart, you turn your face to him because you want to put it in your heart. You want to maintain. You, you are serious of what you hear. You are serious about practicing what you hear. You are serious about pleasing God. You are serious and you're not going to allow anything to interfere with what you've been called to do in your relationship with him. And they have turned to me the back and not the face, though I what? Taught them. In other words, they were taught, they were told, they've been trained, but they did not Take it to heart. They began to gather, gather together, come to Bible studies and services, and not take it to heart. It was just another service. It was just another Bible study. It was just another day. It's just another message. They didn't take it to heart. When you don't take it to heart, you turn your back to Him. Just another day. And they have turned to me the back and not the face, though I taught them rising up early and teaching them, yet they have not listened to receive instruction. But they have set their abominations in the house, which is called by my name, to defile it. What's the house? We are. Amen. We are. Hello. In this, turn them back, turn, you know, turn their back to him and not your face to him. After they've been taught, not taking it to heart, this is what will produce stubbornness, rebellion, and self will. Stubbornness, rebellion, and self will. In Romans 10. In verse 1. Romans 10 verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. 
For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, seeking to establish their what? Oh, let me tell you, this is one of the things that begin to happen. Self-righteousness. They begin to justify and reason. Self-righteousness. And they, they, and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. This is something that begins to happen. They establish self-righteousness, not taking what was placed before them into the heart. Not taking it serious. Everybody got it. And by not doing this, what happens? A person will become stubborn, rebellious, and self will and begin to produce its own self-righteousness. When it's not the righteousness of God, it is the righteousness of self. And self has no righteousness because they're not serious. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Taking it to heart. In verse 1. But there was also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. Who will what? Oh. Second Peter chapter 2. Oh. Second Peter chapter 2. We don't have a second Timothy chapter 2 right now. Second Pete chapter 2, verse 1. Glory! Second PD. But there were also, they were also false prophets among the people. Even as there will be false teachers among you. Let me tell you, false teachers. They teach out of their desire and false interpretation of the word of God. False teachers. A false teacher is one who preaches partial truth, but not the whole truth. And there are many that are out there. Large congregations, small congregations, all kinds. But they don't know it themselves. Because they've been taught what they've been handed down. Does everybody understand that? They've been taught what they... You know why? They've ta been taught what they've been handed down because they've never fulfilled priesthood and had a moment of intimacy. It's amazing in how much division is in the body of Christ in the area about the gifts of the Spirit. Well, tongues are not for today. Well, how would you know? You don't even pray in it. You haven't even been baptized in the Holy Ghost yet. You're still carnal. Well, I love the Lord. That's good. Don't go get some intimacy because I'm telling you what, when that moment of intimacy comes, you get baptized in the Holy Ghost too. If you'll seek Him with all of your heart, you will find him. And then you will know the truth because it's the spirit who teaches the truth. You don't go to school to learn the truth. You can go to every cemetery created. Seminary. <laughs> Hallelujah. And only be taught by what you've been handed down. Traditions of men never having that moment of intimacy, except that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. There was a moment of revelation, a moment of enlightenment, but not the moments of intimacy. Because in the moments of intimacy, you get dressed, the priestly garments are released, and there is a knowing of who he is and who you are. 
and the spirit of truth reveals things, then there's vision. He is known as the spirit of truth. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. Who will secretly bring into destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. The way of truth blaspheme. Well, how is the way of truth blaspheme? Truth is blaspheme. It's rejected. Truth is rejected. Again, I, I, I use the example in the area of how many times people, yeah, well, Jesus, he used to heal, but he doesn't anymore. Well, where's he gone? They're willing to accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but they won't accept him as a healer. Well, and he still baptizes in the Holy Spirit. People still raise the dead and cast out devils, lay hands on the sick. That's a part of a believer. One who is led by the Spirit. There's a difference because it is a ministry of the Spirit. It's not the ministry of the letter anymore. It's a ministry of the Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. And again, many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth is blasphemy. That's blasphemy. Let me tell you, when you come against the truth of God, it's blaspheme. But there's a blaspheme that is unto death. Has everybody got it? That's when you reject Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. If you give up your last breath, that's called blasphemy. Of the Holy Spirit is death. It's unforgivable. Why? Because you're dead. You've rejected Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You die. It's called blasphemy. Is everybody all right? Hallelujah. Oh, praise God. Let's go a little further on this. In verse 3. By covetousness, they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. Verse 4. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood in the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example of those who afterward would live ungodly. And delivered righteous lot who oppressed the filthy conduct of the wicked. For the righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day, seeing and hearing their lawless deeds, then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. And especially, I like this, and especially, he's saying, get, my, here, get your attention, and especially those who walk according to the flesh in the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. This is godly authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed, and they are not afraid to speak evil dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a violent accusation against them before the Lord. Again, in this because they don't take things to heart. They don't take the truth to heart. They just speak whatever they want to speak. They do whatever they want to do. They slander and everything else, not realizing that God is standing before them. Not making that intimacy, that moment of intimacy, that place where priesthood is maintained in ministering to the Lord. Despising authority. Go to Psalm 12. You know, if, if it could be seen what God did to Sodom and Gomorrah, what it, what, how people screamed, how the torment and, the, and, 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 and even during 
Noah, when the flood came and people were drowning to death, if that could be replayed constantly through the world, I think, think people would think differently. <laughs> How God destroyed because of the ungodliness. You know, in the Old Testament, when children were disobedient, if a parent brought that child before the congregation, they knew that kid was dead. They knew he was dead. Why? Because if the parents brought that child before the congregation, they stoned that child to death. You think that might change some things around these days? I know it probably changed me around when I was younger. I know if I hung around people, I know my parents brought somebody to, if I saw a parent bring a kid in front of a congregation, they stoned that kid to death, let me tell you what. Yes, sir. <laughs> I ain't never touching that again. I'm not doing that no more. See, but we don't take things too hard as a life and death matter. We've taken grace as a mystical excuse. Not as fulfilling in God's plan. Oh, I'm under grace. Yeah, you need to get away from her. That's the problem. You're under the wrong grace. I get, I'm telling you, it's amazing to me. What's the matter with fornication? Does God fornicate? Oh, he's God. Well, aren't you a son? Well, uh, what's the matter with reading dirty books or pornography or whatever? What's the matter with that? It's demonic. It's influence of evil. And if you die with a book in your hand, you go to hell. It's real simple. No intimacy, no knowing of God, not even a desire to want to know God. Many are out there. Psalm 12. Let's speak it together. Help, Lord, for the ungodly man ceases, for the faithful dis disappear from among the sons of men. They speak idly, Everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and double heart they speak. May the Lord cut off the flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things, who have said, with our tongue we will prevail, and our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? The oppression of the poor for the sign of the needy. Now I will rise, says the Lord, and I will set him in the safety of for which he yearns. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in the furnace of the earth, purified seven times. You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from the generation forever. The wicked prowl on every side when violence is exalted among the sons of men. In other words, they say, who is Lord over us? No reverence. No fear of God. And one of the things that the enemy likes to do is take a believer who maintained the fear of God to remove it. He begins to erase the reverence of God because of the lack of taking things to heart. Taking things to heart. Again, taking things to heart is you are taking the truth of God and you are causing it to come in. You are protecting it. Believe me, if somebody gave you a $100,000 check you would hold on to that. Even if the wind was blowing, you would hold on to it. You wouldn't let it go for nothing. Well, how much more is the word of God? Money can't bring you to heaven. Only practicing righteousness and relationship will. Amen? Go to Psalm 18. You know, the word says, out of the mouth speaks the what? Heart.
Psalm 18 and verse 20. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. The Lord rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He has recompensed me. For I kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his judgments were before me, and I did not put away his statutes from me. I was also blameless before him, and I kept myself from iniquity. Therefore, the Lord has recompensed me according to my righteousness and according to the cleanness of my hands in his sight. In other words, he rewards those who practice righteousness. He rewards us by taking things to heart. He will reward us. Not that we're looking for a reward. Because our, as, a new, as a believer, we have a desire to please him. So we want to learn. We want to grow. But if we're not willing to grow, if we're not willing to take things too hard, then we turn our back to him. And the things that he begins to bless us with actually begin to come, become a curse because the enemy will have access to steal, kill, and destroy. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Hallelujah. Second Timothy chapter 4. In verse 1, hallelujah, this is for you. I charge you, therefore, the house of true ministries, before God and the Lord Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Well, how are you going to be ready in season and out of season if you're not taking it to heart? You won't be. And believe me, the enemy loves to attack when you least expect him. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires... Because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful to in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and fulfill your ministry. Fulfill your ministry. Listen, your first ministry is priesthood. That is your first ministry, priesthood. And by taking things to heart, there'll be moments of intimacy. And in that, the priestly garments are released. And I'm going to close at Acts 7. Oh, hallelujah. Acts chapter 7 and verse 49. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hardened ears. And hardened what? Ears. And hardened what? Ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit. In other words, they weren't taking it to heart, were they? So he called them a stiff-necked, uncircumcised and heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now become the betrayers and murderers. 
who have received the law by the direction of angels and have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Lord, look, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge him with this sin. And when he had said this, he fell asleep or he died. He was taken home. A man of God who took things to heart was willing to die. Was willing to die for the sake of Christ. But there was something he did before he did. He exposed them. He said, you stiff neck, uncircumcised. You resist what the Spirit is saying to you. You're not willing to take it to heart, nor have you. And this is what we must come to. A place where we're willing to take every word that we hear from the Spirit to heart. Amen? Or we'll be caught up, just like the others, with itchy ears to fulfill own desire instead of His desire. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. And again, we ask that you'll protect this seed, put the blood of Jesus on this seed, and let it grow and bear fruit for your glory. And Lord, that from this day forward, we'll not take anything nonchalantly that comes from your spirit, but that we will take it to heart, submit, obey, practice, and follow. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.